So Douglas Block um, earned his BA in psychology from New York University, has an MA in Clemson from University of Washington, and he's an author of 10 books, including Words That Heal, Affirmations and Meditations for Daily Living, and Healing from Depression, 12 Weeks to a Better Mood. That has been acclaimed as a lifeline to healing for those who suffer from mental disorders and their families. He's also a former radio talk show host and popular public speaker. Douglas has given hundreds of lectures and workshops to businesses, schools, church groups, recovery centers, and national psychology conferences. He lives here in Portland, Oregon, where he facilitates ongoing support groups for people who suffer from depression and anxiety. He also maintains a website and YouTube channel on depression recovery. Thank you, Douglas. There is one there and over there. Um, while Douglas is as Douglas is using the facilities, I just want to do another roll call. I'm gonna I'm gonna yell out the names I have, and if I don't call your name, please let me know that you're there. I have Velma, Dave, Bradley, Tyra, Lori, me, Jordan, Natasha, Star, Janet, Judy, Tara. Rhonda and George. Is there anyone else here that I don't have? Okay. Man, I just want to thank everybody that made it today. This is going to be a really yummy, delicious treat because we have been asking, I know people have been asking for alternative things to talk about when people are calling in and they're thinking about suicide. So um, I feel really blessed to spend some time with Douglas uh, and he is, uh, he's one of us. He is the people <laughs> for the people. And, um, and that's one thing that I really respected. Um, he gets, he gets us, he understands our lingo and he is a wonderful, amazing um, advocate. I actually found, uh, you know, once I started searching, more names started rolling in. So, you know, if we feel like we need more after this, there's other trainers who seemed interesting, too. So there's just it's actually, you know, what's going on in our nation. I guess there's such an increase in this that there really are a lot of people addressing it. But I was really excited to get I think Douglas did a great job of organizing the information and also of listening to Robin and to us about uh, places where we got our language uh, really in alignment with the way that we think and do IPS, which was great. Right, so. David? Do you want to sit right here? Do you yes. want to stand? Okay, yes. no, that'd be great. Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm will, too hot to stand. And I will yeah. the fan. Wait, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have a, have, have my coffee sitting by me. Uh, I guess I can. I, knowing me, I, 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 I spill shit. There you go. Spill shit. Okay. Oh, that way they can see your Here. face. I've got my brochures. Okay. I can definitely help you. And, oh my God, is this a PC? Yes. I'm yes. allergic to PCs. I don't yes. know what I'm going to do. I'm joking, of course. I I had well, Max. If we could afford all Max. So I do, I, I do have one. I do have one silly question to ask. Just the arrows. No, not to me. No. No. So the question is, how do I, how do I, um, on this computer, you can use my Mac, but how do I advance to the next slide? It is not working within the GoToMeeting Jordan. Help. Do you think I'd have the same problem if I were on my Mac? No. Do you have? Well, do you? Do you do you have an no. HDMI cable? No. 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 Yeah. If I, if I, oh, well, that'll help. There we go. Oh, you okay. got those. Okay. So, you, so unfortunately, the keyboard cannot be used. I, I, no, but you can use the arrow key now. The arrow key works. You did? Well, well yep. how come it's working now? And it wasn't left working. and right. Oh, left and right. It's, it's, it, it's, it's counterintuitive. <laughs> All right, now I'll shut up. Now I got my coffee. <laughs> I, I figured out how to use this alien machine. 
By the way, the new MacBook Pro, it's only $3,500. No, it's, I think it's about $7,000. Yeah. Don't worry, I'll, you, I, you can borrow some money from me. I'm very nice. All right. Okay. So much for my sense of humor. Um, so what is this distraction over here? Is that, is That's that, a good meeting. So I'm only partially seeing them. They, see all they can me. see you, yes. I she's she's it over, That's so fine. They can see your face. Seems like there's an echo. Is that true or not? I'm just imagining. Mm -hmm. I've asked people to uh, mute their audio, but. Like yeah. yeah. Is that because people have not muted their audio? Well, yeah, yes. I'll tell yeah. you who it is. We need, we need a technological genius like that. Sorry to help us. I mean, I can handle not having that. I can handle that that distraction, but it's interesting. Judy, Rebecca, Sally, and somebody who didn't fill in their name all needs to mute their mics, please. Oh, I can mute. How do you mute? I just muted everybody. Don't you worry. None of you can talk now. So we'll have to be sure and unmute I'll, un them. I'll unmute everybody when we're done, when he's done speaking. And if you do, or if you, oh, no, that's not going to work because if they have questions, how are oh, they no, going to ask? Like well, maybe they can write down their, their questions well, they, at the end. Because... They can, you guys can all, here, I'll unmute. Isn't there a way for them to signal? Yeah, well, when, I, when I've been all right. to go to the meeting, I can mute it on my end. And when I ask a question, I can mute it. Yeah, okay. you have control. So you do. So we're going to, I'm going to allow him to have control of muting and unmuting you guys. So you guys will not be able to talk until he asks a question and asks for a response. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. So I'm muting. I will ask a couple of questions. I remember much because I have zillions of things. So you've got the mute, mute all and unmute all. And you have to use the mouse pad for that. It's right here. This little square. This, okay. yep. And where's what is it now? So mm -hmm. it's muted right yeah. now, and then the green is unmute. So see all these orange mics. You know what? I'm gonna have you do it when I need it. Yeah. You can sit the next to me. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. And I can I can I can move this thing to the right a little bit maybe. Mm -hmm. Just drag. No, I won't drag, but that's okay. I don't have to, but most of my stuff is right in the center. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, okay. I, I, I can live with that distraction. Oh, you did it. See? It's my computer. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, can you hand me that little blue book right there? Right. All right. So, um, is this... Is this, is this something you, you read or me to read? I already read it. Oh, you did? Okay, great. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, Sharon was very nice to uh, invite me here. I don't know. I don't know when you. It was right. I think uh, May fifth. Uh, I remember the day exactly. So that's June, July. So about two and a half months ago. And I guess you found me through my uh, website or something, or my, my uh, Yes, and you were you know? recommended by one of our staff. All right. Whoever did, I'll, I'll give you a kickback later on. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is a topic that's very meaningful to me. Um, suicide I have uh, well first of all as Sharon probably told you I'm a mental health educator uh, I basically for the past couple of decades I've been sharing information on depression recovery uh, mostly based on my own struggles with depression through uh, my books uh, uh, this is actually a memoir I did of my uh, my worst episode suicidal episode and I'm gonna leave this with you guys as a gift oh, wow. it's, it's it's always good to encourage people to read about other people's stories when they got through. Because what people need when they're desperate is hope. And I, I just with, I was on the phone with a guy uh, driving down here from a uh, young 20 year old who had a breakdown when he went to college. A lot of people start to get depressed and suicidal, believe me, when you're young. I mean, it's the second leading cause of death, ages 18 to 24, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Just right after car accidents. So, you know, I said to him, I said, look, uh, Tyler, you know, um, I recommend these memoirs, read them, because you'll see that these people pull through, and, that, and if they can do it, so can you. So that's why I wrote this book, and this is my gift to you guys. Oh, uh, so, um, yeah, uh, I have this, uh, I've been, as I say, uh, okay, so I have a different a couple different hats. I'm an educator. I've got, like, a master's degree in counseling and BA in psychology, which really doesn't mean anything. 
the, the people who help, help me the most are the people who have the least amount of degrees. Mm -hmm. and then, of course, I have my website, HanleyFromDepression.com, and I d didn't list my YouTube channel, but if you just go to YouTube, Douglas Block Depression, I have about 300 videos up there. And then, of course, there's been me. Uh, has anyone ever heard of the Veterans of Foreign Wars? They were very big during the Vietnam War. They were mm -hmm. they were supporting it anyway. It's what it is. Well, I'm a I'm a veteran of, of a domestic war, like right inside of me. Mm -hmm. Like I've been struggling, four breakdowns, four hospitalizations, and this little bracelet I have came out of my last hospitalization in St. Vincent's Hospital in 2016. So my little souvenir reminding me never to take my mental health for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, One of the memoirs I really recommend is called How I Stayed Alive When My Brain Was Trying to Kill Me. Boy, is that, a, is that, a, is that, a, is that an apt um, talk from a uh, memoir title. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what I want, I'll just tell you what, I, what, I want, what I'm intending to share with you. Three things. One is an overview of suicide. That's going to be part one. Like, you know, the causes, the risks, the demographics. Number two is, I think the most important is inside the suicidal mind. Like, how does a person get into the place where they're thinking of going against the survival instinct, which is programmed us to live. How, why would someone want to counter that? And the third part is about um, how you can help someone who may be in crisis on the phone, which is what you guys do, right? Um, or you, you mostly get people not in major crisis, right? There, but Sharon said there's been a little bit more suicidal callers recently. Is that true? I think true? it's been one particular one for me personally in my experience, but yeah. yeah. So you you are going to get them every now and then, right? Yeah. Okay, it does. Well, it's then you know it's it's good to be prepared because if you can help one person, I mean, you know, one life is priceless. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, because of the material I have to cover, uh, Sharon and I were talking about maybe getting through the parts one and two today and parts three uh, next week or two weeks from now. We'll just see how it goes, but. Um, yeah, this is, we're going to play it by ear, but uh, I'll at least cover, I hope, the first two parts. Now, it is now 2.35, right? So when, when tell me when uh, this needs to end for me so I can pace myself. What, what time? Well, I was thinking that we would meet until 3.30. Okay, an hour. And we could, I mean, we could go longer if people are doing okay. Yeah. Well, my, my preference would be... Can everybody hear? Is everybody doing okay? Hello? I mean, this this is time for people to 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 talk. Can everybody hear? Okay. Yes. I yeah. I can hear fine. Okay. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna I mute you. Can. Okay. You all can. Yes. Okay. So they're they're not seeing me. They're just seeing the slides, right? No, they see they're you. Seeing both. They do. Oh my God! I forgot to comb my hair. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Any any makeup artist in the house? All right. So um. Okay. So um. It makes you feel better. I didn't comb my hair either. Okay, I tried the right arrow. Nothing happened. Um, oh, oh, it's done. Um, oh, you have to click yeah, back see on, on that there. little bottom left. No, click, click on that screen. Which and, the, yeah, right there. Yep, just click anywhere. Like this, like this thing here. Yep. Yeah, that'll work. Now move. Now move the arrow. Yep. Okay. And now the the buttons will work. Again. Okay, great. Okay, and how do I get that? Okay. okay. Bring that. Yep, just bring that up bring at the arrow bottom. Up. But off at the bottom, like yep. there. Click over there, and it's clear. We'll we'll figure this out soon. There we are. Okay, so first slide says suicide of public health crisis. Um, so there, you all heard about the deaths of Anthony Bourdain and Case Pay, right? Mm -hmm. That really got people aware. So there was a big uh, um, article in the New York Times says suicide. Uh, how suicide has become a public health crisis in the United States. It's the 10th leading cause of death. Uh, 120 people die by suicide, and if you do the math, it's every 12 minutes, as I say down there. That, that's amazing. I mean, by the time we finish this converse, this talk, somewhere between five and seven people have taken their lives. Now, you know, whenever there's a fire, you know, or a plane crash, or, you know, a school shooting, horrible things, it's in the news for days, right? Maybe 10, 15, 20 people die. But meanwhile, silently, people are dying unnecessarily. This is something, this is why this has been such a passion for me to try to get information out because it, it, unlike, you know, other things like terrorism, uh, this is largely preventable, as, as we'll see. So, uh, and, and, and the other thing is, imagine if 25% increase had happened in cancer or heart disease. Mm -hmm. 
you know what would be happening? There'd be like a call to arms. There'd be billions of people of dollars, you know, <laughs> used to kind of you know try to and uh, do more research or you know, money, you know, uh, being being uh, uh, you know what allocated for these things. But again, with the twenty five percent increase in suicide, nobody seems to be doing anything. But, but of course, it now came into light because of a, of those two suicides. Okay, some more facts. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the second leading cause of death among college students and teenagers. Um, 45,000 people. You know, when I first wrote this book here, uh, this came out in 2001, Healing from Depression. It's it's my little depression recovery program. Maybe I'll, I don't think I maybe should do a slideshow just on this. But anyway, yeah. I, had, I had facts from the AFSP. I had a whole uh, chapter here on suicide prevention. So this was 2001. It was like 32,000 people, all the way to 45,000. That's more than 25%. I don't know where they got this 25% thing. I teach math. This is like 50%. But anyway, that's a that's more than breast cancer. Twice as many people die of suicide and homicide, more than track back and traffic accidents. So that's why it's such a big deal. Um, mostly white males. Why? Uh, because they use guns and hanging, which are much more lethal. Uh, women are used more like things like, you know, pills, which fortunately don't work most of the time. And 51% of all the people who die by suicide kill themselves with firearms. So... Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of the whole the gun rights, you know, conflict here. It's interesting because the people who are insistent they have fire sign, <laughs> firearms, twice as many people use it to kill themselves and hurt other people. So now there's actually an interesting um, joining together of forces between gun owners and mental health professionals. They're saying, look, have your guns, but lock them and keep them safe because you don't want your kid, you know, getting this out. So in a number of states, there's actually, they're trying to make, if you're going to have a gun, at least be more safe. So that's an interesting coalition, you wouldn't think. Um, okay, so I got this from a, a, a SAVE. Anyone ever hear of them? Suicide Awareness Voices of Education. There are three really good suicide prevention organizations in the United States. They're amazing. And I'll send links to Sharon to pass on to you. If you want to go to their websites, they're phenomenal. So um, myth, first myth, people don't talk about suicide, they don't really do it. They just want attention on it. I've never heard of that. Uh, no, when people talk about their feeling suicidal, it's serious. I mean, why would you want to get attention that way? There's lots of other ways to get attention. If someone's determined to kill themselves, nothing will stop them. Absolutely not. This is one of the this is one of the most important things you guys can do when you're on the phone with people. Buy time. Buy time. There's a there's a, a fact that came out in the New York Times. They ran about five articles. I mean, you never see anything about suicide in the New York Times. And after the, the, these deaths, there were five articles in four days. And one of them said that. The time between someone decides they're going to hurt themselves and the time they carry out is 10 minutes. That's why it means control. It's not always, it's, but it's often impulsive. That's why if you want to kill yourself but there's no gun in the house, you can't do it. So when I was in my last depression, I told my wife, Joan, I saved up all these medications. I said, take them and hide them somewhere because I don't trust myself. Because in a moment of despair, I could take them. So, um, so of course, people, something will stop them. <laughs> Lots of things, uh, you know, connections to other people, um, you know, psychotherapy, in some cases medication, uh, time itself. So um, absolutely not. Um, uh, most people, suicide people don't want to die. They just want the pain to stop, is what I said. Does that make sense? I have a lot more to say about that in just a minute. Uh, let me see if there's anything. Um, yeah, okay. So... Um, Talking about suicide may encourage the idea. Myth, fact is, no, you can't give a suicidal person the idea by talking about suicide. The opposite is true. By bringing up the subject of suicide and discussing it openly is one of the most helpful things you can do. It's been proven to be a protective factor, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone is feeling that way and they bottle up, when you, when you get to talk about it with somebody, oh, it's a relief to get it out and someone is listening. And as you'll, well, you may or may not see, but in my book and all my talks and lectures and my, my videos, the number one protective factor of suicide and the number one contributing factor to healing from all mood disorders is human connection, social connection. Human beings are hardwired for connection for pack animals. Study after study after study shows that when people get the right kind of support, they survive. Conversely, when people are overly isolated, it's, it's a huge risk factor as we'll see. So no, talking about the idea with somebody is actually going to be helpful. Um, People who have died by suicide are willing, people who are unwilling to seek help. And that's, again, wrong. Uh, 
more than half have sought medical help within the last six months, and a lot of people have not sought help because guess what? It's expensive to go to, if you don't have the right insurance. Fortunately, we have something called the Oregon Health Plan, right? Medicaid, thank God for John Hitzhopper doing that as a doctor. My wife's on the Oregon Health Plan, you know? I, there are people in my groups, my support groups. One guy who was really a mess, and he finally got to see a nurse practitioner and, you know, and a counselor, and they both helped this guy immensely. So, um, so yeah, people want to seek help. If, if they will seek help if they're given, you know, the option of doing so. Um, okay, the tragedy of suicide. The ultimate tragedy of mood disorders is suicide. A double disaster. First, there's a person who died. Second, there's those who are left behind. For every person who dies by suicide, 100 people are affected. They can be traumatized by feelings of grief, guilt, anger, resentment, and confusion. So that statistic was given to me by, again, uh, Ryan Price, who's the local coordinator for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. When he told me that, I said, Ryan, no, you, you got to be kidding. A hundred people? I've known my therapist died of suicide. You know, my, my roommate died of suicide. Uh, you know, um, the mother of one of my students died of suicide. I mean, you know, I, this, this has been so intense for me, but a hundred people? So the next week I went to the NAMI walk. Have you guys heard of NAMI, National of Anti-Mentalist? Mm -hmm. Does anyone ever do the NAMI walk? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's, a, it's a fundraising thing for their, I, I, it started in 2003. I used to have a table there. I, I've gone 16 straight years. I was had a horribly infected foot and the doctor said, you can't walk on it. And I walked on it for the NAMI walk. Mm -hmm. Then I got worse. He said, you see? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I am sacrificing myself for mental health, believe me. Uh, but uh, so I went to the NAMI walk and I ran into an old uh, member of my, my men's group, a doctor. And when he was in the men's group, his daughter was suicidal. So, he, you know, he knew what I was doing. So he turned to me. We, I coached him and she got some help and, and she got better. Well, it turns out that she got in a relationship with a guy. And the week before the NAMI walk, he had died by suicide. How traumatic can that be after you've just struggled to see your boyfriend? I mean... And, the, and, and this guy had lived with, with Bob, and, and they had lived with him for a year. Okay, so she was about 24. He was about 26. Again, mid-20s. And uh, he said there were 200 people at the funeral. I said, really? He didn't know that many people. Yeah, but, but he knew someone who knew someone who knew someone. So it, the ripple effect. So the guy was right. The guy at Amos was right. It is 100 to 1. Oh, my goodness. I never would have believed it unless it had been validated the very next day. Or the very next week. So um, this is what Kate Spade's husband said to the New York Times. My daughter and I are devastated by her loss. I can't even begin to fathom life without her. We are deeply heartbroken and miss her already. And of course, one of the things if you're a survivor of suicide is it wasn't any time to say goodbye. You think, what did I miss? I could have done more. And of course, you know, why, why, why? So is anybody... How do I unmute this? I would like to hear from anybody listening. I'm just curious if anybody here or on the on the go to meeting has lost someone to suicide. I mean, it probably yes bottom because yeah. bottom, I'm bottom trying to see where the, all those two all buttons are. Right. Yeah, I'm just gonna pull it out so you can see it. See it. Mm. The two all buttons. Yeah. 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 Green one. There you go. Okay, they're all green. Yeah. Great. Anyway. Um, you don't have to go into any great detail, but just anyone here got a, doesn't have to be a family member. It could be a friend or a colleague or something. What about yourself? Yeah. Um, I don't know. How has it been? How has that been hard to cope with? I, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, it's extremely hard to cope with it. And just the flavors of it that it affected because um, this person. Was my daughter's um, partner's best friend, uh -huh. and um, and he had been to their kids' birthday party, and then I found out about. It. I found out that he was one of my peers when I worked at Shami, a housing program, and so it affected the whole family, but on a completely different level. So it was friends, is you know, I remember sitting with him. Your lounge and visiting with him and um, yeah. Some people never get over it. So my, my best friend is a clinical psychologist. Who liked me. He was a clinical psychologist because she was 19. Her 21-year-old brother, who she idolized, died by suicide. Uh, and 
she's never married since. She's just too afraid of getting divorced. I just remember that this other good friend of mine, who's my age, born in 1949, been a psychiatrist for 40 years. I just realized that his father died by suicide, which is why he went into. And then Thomas Joyner, uh, who wrote the best book on this subject called Why People Die by Suicide, which I read quite a bit in a lecture. His father died by suicide, which made him become a psychologist. And so and I always believe that even when tragedy happens, some good can come out of it. And some so here's two people who had tragedy, family members, fathers, and they, then they went, it spurred them on to do great work in mental health and help others. So, but nonetheless, this is something that people never get over. Anybody else before I move on? Uh, lost somebody? I, I know you can't see tired issues behind you, but oh, yeah. my stepmother is That's the, yeah. So, so you weren't a child when that happened, unfortunately. It only happened three or four years ago, right? Yeah. Well, this happened more than three or four years ago. But I'm trying to remember now. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm trying to well, it's traumatic no matter how old you are, really. But it's really traumatic. Mm -hmm. Like Bourdain and, and Spade both had 14 year old kids. So, but I want to say one thing about that. Alice Miller, the great psychoanalyst, said about childhood trauma. It's not the trauma itself, but the repression of the trauma that causes mental illness later on, or mm. mental health challenges, to use the right language. <laughs> but, uh, uh, because if a person can't talk about it, then it becomes serious. But you know, even children who lose people with suicide or people dying by suicide, if you can get them to talk about it, do play therapy and process it, it's amazing how resilient people are. I mean, think about uh, Sylvia Bell, who did the uh, Sylvia Plath did the Bell Jar, an amazing book, who died by suicide. She writes in her memoir that when she was nine, her father died, and she was not allowed to go to the funeral, and nobody was would talk about it. That's what, what caused her problems later on. Abraham Lincoln's uh, mother died when he was 11. Again, no, no, the family, the no talk, no feel rule that Bradshaw talks about. You know, he was highly depressed and suicidal. So it's even if you lose somebody, if you can go somewhere and talk about it and process it, it's, it just makes the world That's a thing for me, yeah? Yeah. You're, you're thinking about veterans. Yeah. Well, they're a huge risk for population, as know, you know. That's why we did these trainings. But, it, but you're saying it didn't help. So, so why, why, do you, why do you think that was about? Do you have any idea? Yeah, they should have suicide survivors, uh, people who attempt to help do those trainings. That will never work. Right, right. Well, that's the subconscious mind cannot hear the word going. I used to teach affirmation workshops. Yeah, if, you, if I say, I am not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, the subconscious mind hears me. I'm not poor, the subconscious mind is poor. You know what I mean? So, Thomas Joyner in this book, so suicide prevention contracts are. Are all the rage and they don't work. So uh, you sign a contract. I will not kill myself. No, what he does is he gives people crisis cards. When you are in crisis and feeling, what can you do? And you write down these strategies. Oh, I'll call a friend. I'll take a deep breath. I'll go ahead and uh, you know, uh, you, I don't know, watch a video. You know, I, here's what I can do when I'm on the edge, and and this will this will buy me some time. So it's not. It's telling people what to do when they're feeling like they're. You're hopeless of losing it as opposed to telling them not to want to. So I agree with you. They should have people who are, who are again, people who are um, So, yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work that the culture needs to do to help people, but because it's such a taboo subject, and you'll see in a minute the history itself, my God. Okay. Um, yeah, you might as well. Whoops. 
all green, all red. There you are. Oh, you got the all red. I'm going to flip okay. this over again. That's okay. I, I don't, oh, you don't I'm, care? Yeah. So, of course, now I can't, because we got messed up, I can't. I can't. So click on the screen right there. Yep. What? There you go. What just happened? Use yeah. the arrows now. The arrows okay. Well, well, the next thing was the language of suicide. That was the next. Uh, that was the next slide. Oh. Isn't that where you want? Or is what? there one more behind that? No, the, the one before that we just did. Hit the back button. Hit the back arrow. The arrows will work now. Uh, yeah. That was just. That was just mm. essentially the, the man. The, those left behind. You know. Mm. I mean, does that say it all? Yeah. yeah that says it all. I mean, that's. That is grief mm. personified. But again, if you can process the grief, it doesn't stay forever. People have spouses who die, and then they get remarried later on. So, you know, time heals all wounds, right? The language of suicide, okay, so I learned this from the episode. We are not supposed to say commit suicide, because commit means like, like committing a crime. If you say complete suicide, when you complete something, I finally completed my degree. Thought of a good thing. So what they say and what Joyner says is the best language is die by suicide. What do you guys think of that? I still think that has a negative connotation. What does? Death. Well, 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 how would you? How, how would you then? What's an alternative? I'm, 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 you know, I'm not saying this is the best no, way. No, but... no, no. I, I, I agree with that. Of all those options, that's the best choice. Okay. But still, the word death is still very negative. Well, but, but you can say my, 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 so and so died of cancer. I mean, people, mm -hmm. death is part of life, right? Right. Right. So, I mean, that's that's the best way. I'm not I'm not disagreeing. Right. You're just saying that you still have the word dying. Yeah. Okay. How about was lost to suicide? I like that better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm going to call AFSP. Guys in New York, listen to me. You're changing your language as of tomorrow. Lost by suicide. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. You can see something. <laughs> Did I hear a little question back there? Okay. No, I was just agreeing with that. I think that lost is the best one. Or I was thinking of something else, but yeah. lost is better. Well, I can't think well of you can guys can think of somebody who... or something like yeah. that, but lost, I think, is... Lost to suicide. Mm -hmm. I like that. There's also an element of grieving in there that, right. that recognizes yeah. that it's a loss. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, All right, like so I'm going to get the executive director's uh, address and name. I want us to start a campaign. <laughs> we have a better way to talk about it. No, seriously, I think loss of suicide is better than that. I, I fully agree with you. But commit suicide, it like blames the person. Okay, so over in in the past, many suicide cultures considered. Oops. Log off warning. Log off warning. Oh, it's just yeah. You can just close that. Can I can I can I click on Stay Connected? That's fine too. Either way. I don't. I never know because. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so when, you know, the, the Greeks, it was against law in Greece to, to die by suicide. You couldn't have funeral rites. In Rome, mm -hmm. you couldn't pass on land to your heirs. Catholics, of course, you couldn't have a religious burial. Same thing with Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, yeah, on, crime. Shane. Yeah, it used to be a crime. Um, only until like the 1900s was, was, could you be buried in a... In a a uh, uh, Catholic uh, graveyard if you, if you died by suicide in, in the Catholic tradition. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been around. It's, this has been around for a long time. So you see this? Now, you guys are all going to have this slideshow with a link. So see, see where there's a link down here? So I'm not going to go. And the, and the, uh, because of the time factor, I would like to show you this article and the, the story behind it. But uh, there's a guy named Michael Cohn in Boston. He died by suicide, and his parents were brave enough to actually list cause of death mm. in the obituary. Really? And it's That's all about fair. why they did it. Yeah. So you click on that, you can see the article, and you can listen to the, you can listen to the thing. Uh, it's, it's it's here and now. It's, it's a radio show on NPR every morning, so it's not a video, but you can hear the audio. Very moving. My psychiatrist, who I used to had when I was in my last depressive episode, on May third, two thousand sixteen, he was hailing Hardy on more May fourth. 2016, he didn't show up to work, and all I said is he's dead. They would not tell why he died overnight. He was in perfect health. I think I know the reason, but they refused to talk about it. So, this is again, we have to, we have to, you know, essentially, um, uh, you know, let go of the stigma. There's nothing wrong. We, we, you know, however you look at, you know, mental health challenges, whether you think it's in the brain or it's the environment or both, you know, 
nothing different than having any other kind of disorder, so there's no shame in it. Okay, the causes. It's very complex, long end stage of mental health challenges, multiple losses, setbacks, and stresses, multiple intersecting factors that come at the time of death. So you can have a, a predisposition to depression or suicide, but it usually takes a trigger to set it off. Oftentimes, loss of love is one of them. But it can mean, uh, it can do, um, it can be many things, like, um, uh, Gordon, has anyone ever heard of Gordon Smith? Uh, he was used to be senator. His son died by suicide. He wrote a book about it. He, he lost a job. Remember Bernie Madoff, the guy who uh, stole those millions of dollars in 2008? His son died by suicide two, two years after the anniversary of his father's arrest because he was so ashamed of what his father did. A guy named Vin Foster, who was in the Clinton administration, a member of the uh, federal government, he had all sorts of accusations uh, about a controversy, and he didn't want to go back to Arkansas and be humiliated, so he died by suicide. So. A lot of times it's not just a mental health disorder, but just people. It's like people can't cope or they don't think they can cope. But you can always cope if you just have the right tools and support. That, that's, I mean, mm -hmm. there's no reason why, you know, Vince Foster had to take his own life. Even though somebody goes back to Arkansas, he's he got shame. You know, there's still people who love him. You know, his, I'm sure his, his mother still loves him. So, but, so yeah, so it's a whole bunch. Of, it's, it's never one cause of suicide. Okay, risk factors. Wouldn't you like that, that sign? Yeah. Okay, so in the um, AFSB, they, they talk about it, three kinds of risk factors, health uh, risk factors and environmental and historical. Mm -hmm. So health, you can just write there. And you can look this over again when you when you have the notes. Mental health conditions, chronic pain, head injuries. What is that called? Traumatic brain injuries, TBI. Mm -hmm. What is that thing they have when the football players get knocked in the head? Okay. Yeah, but there's something, something in cephalophily. C no, it's something that's not, there's a, there was a quarterback for the Washington State football team who died by suicide. It was all over the news in the Northwest. And then they then found out that he had this chronic brain encephalopathy, some, or CTE, traumatic, traumatic, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Any encephalopathy has to do with some sort of a, a pathology of a certain part of the brain. Anyway, it was, it was the repeated concussions that made him, his brain messed up, which led to the suicide, not yeah. just quote unquote mental illness. So uh, yeah, so head injuries, and you see a lot of veterans, right, coming back from Iraq, a lot of veterans. Oh, oh alcohol, of course, the problem about alcohol when you're, when you're depressed or suicidal, you lose judgment. That's the first thing that goes when you drink. So people will do things under the influence of alcohol, they lose, you become more impulsive, you know, things they never would do, okay. Environmental risk factors, stress of life events, divorce, Following stress of bullying, well, that's a that's a big one for teenagers. Mm -hmm. It's actually the, what they call the LBGTQ, mm -hmm. such a high, much higher rate for them because of all this, you know, the bullying that goes on. There's something called the. Has anyone ever heard of the Trevor Foundation? You have. Anyway, it's a it's a teenage boy who was gay who was bullied and he died by suicide. And his parents started this huge foundation in his honor. And it's, you just click at Trevor Foundation. It's, Millions of dollars they're spending to help educate people. Another another good thing can happen out of a bad event. Uh, access to lethal means, especially guns, yes, and social isolation. Well, economic hardship, yes. Yeah, so why are all these deaths happening of white males in, you know, in the Midwest? Yeah, yeah social pressure definitely. But uh, uh, you know, in Japan when they had this big recession years ago, the suicide rates went up tremendously. You know. Oh yeah! Uh, oh my God! Yeah, no, they, and and also in the Asian countries you can't talk about it. Yeah. So so I, I have so many anecdotes. I mean, I mean, you could spend the whole day talking about anecdotes. But on my YouTube, <laughs> my YouTube live chats or my YouTube comments, this woman uh, says, "Hey, I'm I'm going to kill myself. What should I do?" I said, well, "Don't. Just uh, just here. Let's chat. Here's some resources." So I said, "Well, what what are you doing? Well, I'm in high school. Well, why don't you go to the high school counselor?" Oh, we don't have high school counselors. Yeah. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go to the nurse? Oh, we don't have nurses. I said, what is this person living in Podunk, Nebraska? Turned out she was in an elite private girls' school in Saigon, Vietnam. Oh. The, the, the stigma of mental health is so bad in, in Asia that they don't even have, like, counselors in the high schools. So this person had nobody to talk to or turn to except for me and YouTube. And, and uh, anyway, I, I think she's doing okay now. But to, 
I was just blown away. Elite private girls school in Saigon and no, no, no counselors and no nurses. Oh my goodness. This is why there's like a million people a year dying by suicide. Or it's, I think it's around 800,000. Historical, um, previous suicide attempts, previous self-injury, family history, mental health conditions, childhood abuse, and neglect. So, so this is one of the things. If you, I had a, one of my best students had a mother who was very depressed. My Polish, she wanted to come to my group. I said, well, probably not the best boundaries. Then uh, a week or two later, after we went to the, the student conference, her daughter was failing, several half Catholic, and she finally got her, her act together through my tutoring and other people's tutoring, and the mother said, thank goodness, I'm, I know that Jane is going to make it through high school. God, I don't have to worry anymore. And two days later, she jumped into the backyard swimming pool that, with a uh, cinder block around her neck and drowned herself. So then this woman, Jane, it's not her real name, said, oh, my mom had tried to uh, die, commit suicide three other times. I said, why didn't you ever tell me? If I had known that, I would have got, you know, I would have, you know, intervened or tried to intervene. I mean, I knew she was depressed. A lot of people were depressed or, you know, have bipolar disorder, but, no, you know, only a few amount of them, you know, try suicide. But the fact she had three other attempts, that, that is a, that's a red flag right there. Yeah. So, um, of course, uh, Divorce, financial crisis, we talked at, about that earlier. Um, okay, warning signs. So again, there's verbal, the person talks about, you know, if someone tries killing themselves, don't think, oh, they're trying to get attention. It's, it's absolutely serious. Uh, I, I used to tell everybody I was in that, in that uh, space, and it, it, one of the reasons I'm alive, hopelessness, being a burden to others, they would be better off without me. Now, I have a question to ask you guys. I, I don't get it. Um, I never thought in my four suicide office that I was a burden to anybody, but a lot of people tell me that's how they feel. People I know have attempted. So do you understand why someone would think that way? Why they think they were burned to others when they were severely depressed or having like a chronic schizophrenia? Why would they, why would they say someone's better off without me? Does anybody have a clue? I, I don't really. You do? For me, um, I feel like the border burden to people and I have friends who feel that way because a lot of the time when we get the courage to reach out a lot of people don't want to hear it they're like oh, right. like they don't respond or they're too busy and they make you feel kind of stupid or right. or any kind of weird about feeling that way so a lot of times people do hold back and don't reach out at, or feel like a burden oh I see because people don't want to be bothered they you know, especially if you've got a lot of maybe a lot of friends or a few friends or family who are dealing with difficult times, and you know, people just want to go out and have a good time. They want to do this. They don't want to get that message on their phone. They don't want to talk about it, or you know, maybe they just don't understand it, so they don't know what to say, and so they maybe out of panic say something that they weren't they shouldn't have said or something. So the last uh, for that reason, the past twenty years, I've been running this. Uh, Depression Support Group. I'm going to leave these brochures. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Lines for Life? Yes, right. when, whenever people dial 1 800 suicide, uh, the National Suicide Helpline, Lines for Life, it goes to them. They're in John's line. You have to call them just like you guys. Anyway, I'm on their list also, the Mono uh, County Crisis Line. So this is a group. These groups are so peer run, peer support groups. I run them, but I, they're really. I'm really a peer group facilitator. There's no, I'm not like the counselor or the doctor. I don't do anything. I just say, has anyone ever been to a 12 step group? Yeah. yeah. You know what they are, right? They, so, so, so what I run are AA groups for people with mental health challenges. And all I do is I just facilitate and call, I'm like calling people and it works because what people feel like they're, they're not alone. They're not the only one. Someone understands, someone can listen to them all that stuff. So it, that's why these groups work. So I'm going to leave these brochures. If anybody, if you guys get calls and you think someone would benefit from peer support, you can just, uh, you know, send this in or just give them my, my contact information. We have had people come after suicide attempts who all healed. Matter of fact, everybody who has come to the group who is willing and wanting to get help has, has come out the other side. So that address there. So, yeah. So thank you. That's very, it was very helpful. So, so if, imagine if you had a place to go where you could talk about your pain and people would listen and say, oh, yeah, I know it's, a, it's like I go through it myself. That's usually healing. That's why I, I want to 
That's why I'm on the one line, because I want to be that person. For, for other people, right, exactly. I didn't have yeah. that for I Yeah, yeah. So, so in my group, it's just one, one of, you wouldn't believe it, though. There are not that many depressions. There's lots of 12-step groups, like a 1,000 a day in Portland. Oh, yeah, I, I'll premature? take it. No, I'm, 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 I'm uh, this fan behind me is really helping. Oh, good. Remember Johnny Carson used to go like this with a question. If young, remember Johnny Carson? Okay. Yeah, the, remember the question? I, I mean, he was playing some sort of envelope. Yeah, yeah, the envelope. <laughs> and he, he would what? He would guess the question and able to read the answer. Heck, my man, it was very, very funny. Uh, I, <laughs> the great Marta. What, what, what was this guy's name? The great Mardoff. He had some sort of a. I'll have to look it up on Wikipedia. Okay, and okay, so you messed with something. So any. So what do I do now? I just go this way? Maybe this way? Yeah. No, no we're, we're on it. Okay. No, okay, hold on for a second. How do, how do I get to slide yeah, 17? To the slide. This thing right They're here? Right okay, mood warning signs, uh, depression, irritability, humiliation. Okay, relief and sudden improvement. So this is important. So... Did I, did I skip that? Yeah. Okay, well, behavior warning signs, increasing use of drugs and alcohol, withdrawing from activities, isolating from friends and families. You can see when teenagers get depressed, they don't go out with their buddies anymore. They start going to classes or raise any sort of withdrawal. Uh, and then um, mood warning signs. Okay, so I was in hospitalized at New York Hospital in 1982, and we had this... This guy on the ward, I remember him quite well, and he started to get better. And I said, "Wow, I guess you can, I guess you can leave now." And then the next day, he jumped off uh, the George Washington Bridge and died by suicide. So sometimes, when a person starts to feel better, they have more energy to hurt themselves, but they're still depressed. So it's very, very tricky. I've never seen that happen personally, but everywhere I read about it, that sometimes a person will appear to be getting better and uh and and the other the other thing that i've heard is that um that uh well they finally made the decision and so they feel a sense of relief i'm not struggling anymore so you know as a result of that um you know i'll go ahead and go for it any questions on this has anyone ever heard of that there's a, there's improvement that actually could be a sign that a person's in more danger it's yeah. counterintuitive but this is what this is what clinicians have told me. And it is though, I think it makes sense to me because if you feel like you're making progress and you're doing following everything, and then that's not working, I mean, right? I think you expect it to work quicker, you know, more quickly than things do. They just take longer. But I can see where somebody would be kind of vulnerable in that place. Mm -hmm. Thinking, oh, it's getting better. What happened? What's wrong with me? Yeah. Kind of things. See where that. Take your right uh, To get through any sort of suicidal episode or depressive episode or bipolar episode or schizophrenic episode, you have to have something that the Bible used to call long suffering. You have to be able to hang in there. Unfortunately, you take an antibiotic, a ten-day course, the infection mostly goes away. These things are interminable, and the, and, the, and the things that we have, the modern psychiatry has, are not very good. <laughs> or they are effective, but not nearly as effective as they could be. So sometimes you do all the right things. You read chapter support. You take your medication, if you're on medication. You go to the gym. Do all the things I talk about in my book, and you're still feeling lousy. You say, oh, my God, this is not working. I'm not going to stick around. But the fact is, as you'll see in a minute, nothing stays the same forever. But it's so tough. To stick around when it's not working and that's why you need other people as cheerleaders to be holding a field for your recovery uh, nobody but nobody gets through these situations by themselves it's just it's too much for any one person I, and anytime someone has withdrawn that's when i've seen people die by suicide um, mm -hmm. when they have withdrawn from family friends gone off somewhere like my therapist moved out of portland after her father died and it was just too much you left her, her whole support system behind her uh, yeah, depression is very painful. Yeah, that's. Does anyone know that's where that's from? Is it from the 16th chapter? You're right. My God, uh, this should be Jeopardy. 
you just got ten thousand dollars right there. Woo, How did you know that? I didn't know it. Because I recognized it, and I didn't think of it at first. That's the style. That's he Michelangelo. Said, yeah, he, he's going to he the was inferno. Big and on the ceiling, so close up and he's a little fuzzy. <laughs> well, he's not having a good time. Okay, so protective factors. What actually helps? We've talked about the risk factors and the warning signs. Access to mental health resources, like this place, community connection, community support, religious or spiritual beliefs. Uh, you know, there are people who say, um, you know, life is sacred. I, I, you know, uh, I remember um, when I was seeing my therapist in '96. I said, well, I don't think it's really wrong to die by suicide. I mean, I don't think there's any spiritual reason why you shouldn't. He said, she said, I worry about you. You're, you're at much greater risk than someone who has a strong spiritual belief against it. And time, putting distance between the impulse and the means to carry it out. For sure. Uh, also, you see where it says connection and community support? I have I have more about that in the next section, but there was a gal who's one of my biggest YouTube fans who told me uh, that she had, I think her daughter was about four or five at the time, and she was ready, definitely ready to do herself in, but she couldn't leave her daughter. And now her daughter's 12 and a great person, and that's it. That's why she's alive, because of her daughter. Now, I know that some people have children and go through it, but many more people stay alive because of, you know, uh, because of they don't want to, you know, because they have someone they love and someone who needs them. Absolutely. Matter of fact, my favorite story, <laughs> what did you say? My daughter was like that for me. I mean, when you were she suicidal, was, she was an I anchor? Was, I was, yeah, I went through some very, very hard times when she was really young and getting as well as I could to be alive for her was definitely a huge motivation. Yeah, and when I was going swimming at Dishman, the lifeguard told me, I, I was very, I kind of unloaded to her. She was very sympathetic. I, I said, you know, I don't think I want to die by suicide because I don't have any children, but there's so many friends and family members. I think people would be crushed. I've seen, as a survivor, I, I've seen what it does. She said, you know, other people are a good reason to stay alive. I remember she told me that. That was very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. But not just other people. A man walks into my group in 2002, three-piece suit, Rolex watch, $15,000, uh, came up in a Porsche, amazingly good-looking, about 35, uh, looked, uh, uh, you know, he, he was Brazilian. Turned out he was one of, a star Brazilian soccer player. Do you know about soccer in Brazil? It's a religion. And he, I said, why are you here in my group? He said, oh, well, the other last night I went ahead and turned on the uh, – put a, a tube in my car and turn on the gas and I was going to kill myself by carbon monoxide. I said, why would you do that? He said, oh, my fiance just rejected me and I can't live without her. Well, why didn't you go through with it? Oh, well, the gas was running and the fumes were coming in and I realized um, I forgot to feed my dog. Yeah. I said, no, yeah, I don't like dogs. He said, well, I, I do. So he went he fed the dog, came back, turned it on again. And I said, well, why didn't you do the second animal? I realized if I died by suicide that evening, there would be nobody left to feed my dog in the morning. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't kill him. So. Yeah. It's my not daughter did the same thing. She was, we got a notice from the school, which, and she was, had everything all laid out how she was going to do it. And when she came home, we were talking about it. And um, the subject, this, she was still in school, and the subject came up that, you know, in a couple of years, we plan on going to Disneyland some of the things that she had wanted to do. Right, right. And that right there was enough to um, say, maybe I'll wait until after then. Right. And she still kind of had it in her mind. She struggled with it for a little longer. Yeah. But, yeah. It's always good to wait, as you'll see. All right, well, now we're going to part two, Inside the Suicidal Mind. How does someone become suicidal? Well, the greatest... Uh, investigator of suicide is a guy named Edward uh, Schneidman. He studied some, he started something called the American Association of Suicidology, one of the three organizations I mentioned. And he has a, a book that, that's a classic called um, The Suicidal Mind. And he says it all comes because, this is, this is a no-brainer, right? People want to get out of pain. You didn't need a PhD in like a book to tell you that, right? So I write in, I write in my, my book, my memoir here, right? I, I talk about, uh, I have a chapter called uh, 
And by the way, I have some extra copies of this. So when I come back again, I'll bring another copy. You're free to loan this out. Just say property of the warm line. Do not steal. <laughs> remember, remember, Abby Hoffman had a book called Steal This Book. None, none of you are remember, old enough to remember I, that anyway. I traveled across the United States with a busload of yippies going to RV Ten parties. percent, my battery is failing. Oh my goodness. Okay, we're going to get this. Oh. Which battery is failing? My internal battery. I have, oh. I have a pacemaker. No, I'm joking. No, the one that on the thing. It says. That's just for the. It's okay. That's just for the projector. So you have a. You, this is a power cord. Yep. Look at that, Jordan. He's just, he's when, like when he's you, you need Jordan, he's right there. Yep, yep. So it's three things. One is the pain is intense. Two, you can't escape it. So the guy who called me on the way down here, he's in Philadelphia with his father on a, on a trip. Dad loves him. Dad right over there. talked to me about how I was helping his son. So they went from, they went from Boston to Philadelphia. And the thing just followed them around. That was my last video on my YouTube channel. Why does this question always follow me around? So does a tumor if you have cancer, right? So it's intense. And here's the last one. It feels like we'll never know. That's, that's the killer right there, the sense of hopelessness. So that's how people become suicidal. So, um, so this diagram saved my life, and you'll see why. Now, if I click on a link, it'll take me. This is on the Internet, right? So if I go to a link, it'll, it'll take me something, yeah, right? Okay. So this is uh, from a book called Out of the Nightmare by Ron Roy. He has something called the aggregate pain model. It says, suicide is not chosen to come from the emotional pain exceeds the resources. Isn't that a very beautiful, simple diagram? Mm -hmm. you got pain, you're coping resources. So how do you get the skills back in balance? You have to lighten the load of the pain, or you have to increase the coping resources. It, it's the latter, because the pain of depression doesn't seem to want to go away. Anytime soon, but if you get more coping resources over on the right side, that's the key. So, um, yeah. Right. Yes, right. That's why so many people die by suicide in America when they don't need because they don't have the right support because community mental health resources are so foreign. To me that people, I thought they live in a very the culture is just so fragmented compared to the way it used to be when I was a kid or when my mom was a kid. You know, there used to be close communities. We all go to the church. We all go to the same drugstore. You know, there were much more homogeneous. And so you had this protective community around you. So people are, here's the key word. People are much more isolated than they used to be. And someone mentioned about pressure. Who mentioned about pressure? We are Well, uh, I should have given you a link here. I'll send it to Sharon. I'll put it next to it. Uh, PBS News Hour, has anybody heard of that? Channel 10, you know, public broadcasting, mm -hmm. big story. MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I grew up in New York, you know, everybody there had to go to great colleges. By the way, I recommend a very good uh, film called RBG about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just a little side of documentary. It's awesome. Anyway, we're both New Yorkers. But uh, they, six, six students and one professor died of suicide within a three-month period at MIT. So they interviewed the kids who are, you know, who were going to do it and didn't. I said, why, why, why? You're like, you're on top of the world. You're the most elite college in America, aside from Harvard. Oh, they said, but there's all this pressure. And, you know, you have an internship and someone else is making more money than you. And, you know, you want to get to go to Harvard Law School, but maybe you can only go to the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So a lot of pressure on these young people. Much too much. Hey, when you go to your doctor, you don't say where you go to college, do you? You don't say, where do you go to graduate school? If you have a law, hire an attorney, you don't say, which law school do you go to? You just hear, this, this is a good attorney, right? Uh, so so th all this pressure they feel about they have to be in the right college or right graduate school, it's nonsense, but they don't see it. Uh, okay, so I just want, I'm just going to go here because this is this website is why I'm alive. Now, what do I, which which thing do I click? This one? Open, open link, a new pad? Will that work? Will I be able to get back to this? Yeah. Okay, so where is where is my new link? Oh gosh. Where is there? The, 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 the one right next to the top is on. Oh. Scroll your mouse up to the top of the screen. Okay. Now what? Left or right? Click on that one. Okay. There 
Okay, so can you do command? You probably can't do command plus on this like you can on Apple and make it bigger. Uh, don't, you have to go. Don't, don't worry about it. It's not worth taking the time, but I'm just going to read it to you. All I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first two paragraphs, and then I want you to go look at the site yourself. So I was scrolling, and I came upon this. It says, if you are thinking about suicide, read this first. And here's just the first two paragraphs. And I don't know if you can send links to the people who call you. If you are feeling suicidal now, please don't. Please stop long enough to read this. It will only take about five minutes. I do not want to talk you out of your bad feelings. I am not a therapist or another mental health professional, only someone who knows what it is like to be in pain. I don't know who you are or why you are reading this page. I only know that for the moment you're reading it, and that is good. I can assume that you are here because you are troubled and considering ending your life. If it were possible, I would prefer to be there with you at this moment, to sit with you and talk face to face and heart to heart. But since that is not possible, we'll have to make do with this. I just, I could not, I, I couldn't stop reading it. And then I, you know, I, then I kind of scroll down the page and this is, of course, you know what Mark Twain says, good writers borrow, but great writers steal. I don't even know how to scroll down the page here. But uh, how do you make this yeah, thing go down? This thing over here? No, no, on the very bottom corner. Oh, yeah. yeah it's so on Macintosh. Anyway, I just want to show you the, whoops. Oh, there it is. So there's that diagram I showed you oh, earlier. Yeah. So this will take five minutes to read. And I want, I would want to recommend that everybody who's hearing me on, on, on the, you, you know, the go to and everybody who's here, click on this link and read this page. It could probably save someone who's calling you. Uh, you, know, you see at the very end, she says, now I'd like you to call someone at the very bottom. Yeah. yeah. After that whole that thing, he says, now I'd like you to call someone. And anyway, so this, uh, this is incredible, incredible. Uh, it's gotten over a million views. I first read this in 1996. I know that's, uh, I know that's really, it seems like a long time. Oh, that's good. It's in tight. Okay. So, um, ways to address hopelessness. Um, so, why do people feel hopeless? They feel hopeless because they think the pain is going to go on forever and it will never stop. Uh, the feeling of hopelessness is the biggest predictor of suicidality, says Aaron Beck, who's a great, great psychologist in cognitive therapy. However, assure the person that although that may feel like it, the pain, although it may feel like the pain is forever, suicidal feelings are temporary. Aha. The truth is that all states of mind are impermanent. Anyone ever study Buddhism? They talk. They talk about. They talk about uh, Buddhism. Uh, I mean. I mean. I, I mean. One of my, in Buddhism, the central concept is impermanence. Hey, look. Look back to your lives. Think two years ago. Were you the same person you were two years ago? No. Have, have circumstances changed? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in your life, but even the world. I mean, just think. Uh, what, where two years ago we had a different president. Oh well. Anyway, so <laughs> so things things nothing stays the same forever. That is that is that is a I can tell you right now the only thing constant in the physical universe has changed. That is a that is a spiritual and scientific truth. Uh, by the way, uh, there's a really great book called by Matt Hay called Reasons to Stay Alive. You might want to read that memoir. He says if you ever believe that a depressed person wants to be happy, you're wrong. They could not care less about the luxury of happiness. They just want to feel an absence of pain, to escape a mind on fire where thoughts blaze and smoke like old possessions lost to arson, to be normal. So uh, remember that the scale we saw a little earlier? So when I was suicidal, if I woke up the next day and my pain had even dropped 20%, the suicidal feelings would go away. Then if I woke up the next day and I felt either more anxious or more depressed, they would come back. So as the pain waxed and waned, so did my suicidal feelings. So I realized, so that, that was that was the gift that I wasn't in chronic pain. Like I have, I have a scale of one to ten. Right, ten is the greatest pain, one is the least. So most of the times it was eight or nine, but every now and then I was at a five. Oh, that's manageable. So that's how people can survive these things because there are little tiny, small breaks in the action, and that's where you can kind of take your breath, you know, draw upon your emotional resources and your emotional bank, and, and live to fight another day. So it's like being, in, like being in the war, you know, where you said you served. In the battlefield, you know, it's you're in the trenches. You have to survive moment to moment. You're in the heat of a battle.
combat. Well, when you're seriously depressed or suicidal, you are in combat, except it's not you versus the enemy. The enemy is your, this, you know, in here, it's, it's the enemy. It's survival versus death is what you're doing. With. So, um, yeah, so when the pain goes down, the suicidal impulses decrease, even for a minute or an hour, that's, that's enough. So, yeah, so that's what Matt Pig said, you know, people don't want to be happy, they just want not to have pain. All right, um, so uh, do we all agree? Oh, so here's the next slide right here. Oh, yeah, so I read my book that being super depressed or suicidal is like being in a tunnel with both. You've ever heard the light at the end of the tunnel? I don't see any light down there, do you? I just see an entrance all off, right? So, really, where do you see any light? It's like a little X. This right over there? Well, it's right on the top of the square. I'm well, just... well, there shouldn't be because the way it feels like is, the rest of it's but both of the both ends of the tunnel are blocked off, and there's a sign that says no no exit. By the way, it was a great book by Sartre. Boy, he was depressed. All those existentialists. No exit. Just, just. This is the title that you don't want to read that, that short story with that title, right? But no, it feels like there's no excess, right? Well, I'm trapped. It's over. I'll never see the light again. Anyone ever felt like that? I bet everybody in this room has felt like that. But what happened? How come, how come, what happened to get you out of that state? What'd you say? Oh, definitely overcome money. But the light eventually, eventually came. Right? Eventually. It might have taken some time, but it did happen. That's the key. Yeah, but see, look, the dinosaurs died just yesterday, 65 million years ago. So, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, a couple of years in cosmic time is like that. So, But the question is, then how do you hang in there? That's that's the $64,000 question. How do you wait? How do you stay alive one day at a time while you're waiting for the light to return or while you're waiting for the fog to lift or while you're waiting for your brain to get back in order? That is the survival key for anybody who's ever in these states. And you on the phone, if you could just, you know, give people an extra hour, an extra minute, or even an extra second, it, it's, it's just, because time, you know, there's an old song by the Rolling Stones, time is on my side. Yes, it is. I wanted to be Mick Jagger. No one knew that. <laughs> I was the biggest nerd in high school, but I always wanted to be Mick Jagger. I, seriously, my alter ego. <laughs> anyway, that's the song by the Rolling Stones, time is on my side. Well, it's about, eventually you're going to come back to me, you know, you who reject me, but it's on your side because eventually uh, what's going to happen is this too shall pass, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it going to save a life? Or what goes down must come up, right? Mm -hmm. Or So this was given to me when I was at the Living Enrichment Center, which is a spiritual center and that's no longer just in Wilsonville. Anyone here in Wilsonville? Mm -hmm. Huh? You are from Wilsonville? Mm -hmm. But you've heard of it. I have, yeah. of course. It's a, little, it's a little dumpy town down I-5, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, there was a big mega church there I used to go to. Very cool place before it went bankrupt. And someone gave me this point while I was in my suicidal depression. Do you guys know anything about the Phoenix bird and about mm -hmm. the mythology? What do you know about it? Yeah. Right, 500 years it lived. It died, burned in a funeral fire, and then rose from the ashes, lived another 500 years. So in medieval Christianity, they, they thought about it as like the symbol of the death and resurrection of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Or the rising and ascending of the sun. I mean, this theme of death and resurrection, they have in, in, in Egyptian mythology, it was it Osiris, someone went down to the underworld and came back. I mean, this theme is uh, universal. But I just really relate to this. I mean, it's that my logo. If I were likened to shamanism, that would be my power animal. So, Yeah. So um, we do resurrect. Okay, um, yeah, I, I talked about those other beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Other people did are without me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Thomas Joyner says there are three predictors of suicidality. One is the sense of burdensomeness to others. That's number one. Number two is um, what he called failed belongings. How does he just say rejection and isolation? That would be a lot easier, right? He's a PhD. And the last thing he says, not having a fear of death. Now, that has saved my butt many times. I, I don't know about you, but I'm scared to die. I mean, I, but some people, I don't know, they, they don't have that same. So he says, if someone has, and he says, oftentimes people have to build up to it. They have to like, well, people will cut themselves. And there's a whole list of things that people do to get, 
they get so the the idea of self harm becomes more comfortable to them. They get more used to it. Uh, what do you say? You can get comfortable with pain even by somebody else inflicting it on you. Really? Yes, that's what like that's what happened to me after each deployment and each time I would get inflicted in like an injury from actual combat. You learn to understand and know what that pain feels like. So then the next time it happens, you don't even flinch. Okay. Well, I mean, do you think do you think that's maybe why veterans are much more uh, have a high mm -hmm. suicide rate because? They have gotten used to being in pain, and, exactly and, and they exactly they they become callous to it. Yeah. Because at a certain point, you, when you see somebody point a gun at your head, it doesn't even phase you anymore. You just go, oh, somebody's pointing a gun at me. So if you point a gun at your own head, it's it's, it's not it, it's not any different. The, the idea of me pointing a gun at my own head is absolutely terrifying. However, I was ready to do it, and I saw my counselor in Florida when I was living with my parents. So my second breakdown, I had to go back to the East Coast and live with my parents. So I saw this guy. I said, you know. I hear that guns are the most perfect way to do it. I think I'm going to get a gun and just shoot myself, I guess. He said, I wouldn't do that. I said, why not? He said, well, I had a client who did that just last week, and he pulled the trigger, but he didn't die. He just became a vegetable. Mm -hmm. That guy made me think twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't have a gun. I really wasn't at immediate risk, but I never forgot that story. Like he said, don't be so sure, you know. <laughs> it's hard to kill yourself, and there's actually a book called um, – Suicide, the forever de decision by a, a really cool guy whose name I'll remember in a minute, um, Paul Quinette, who said, he has a whole chapter that says, harder to kill yourself than you think. So that's, that's one reason, you know, they, maybe to avoid that. I had a neighbor that did that, yeah. too. Put a gun in his mouth and thought it was going to go off and go ahead. And went through his head and he lived. Mm -hmm. Lost an eye. Is that all? That's I, it. And his tongue, his I, mouth. I'm not sure if this is our exact ending point, but maybe you can find a point to. to yeah, right. Close this I, I, actually, because I also would like for the people on the line to have the opportunity right. to, to debrief. So, if yeah, so, so you know, we're very, very close. Okay. Actually, here's the deal. Okay, hold on. Uh, okay, so there were only one, two, three, the Kevin Hines slide. Oh, yeah, well, the, the five minute thing, but I can do that next time. So, yeah, I'm, I, what I've, we've done, it, we've, it doesn't really show here this, because you have the link, right? You don't actually have the original document. But I think I have 62 slides. I think we're basically on around slide 30. So I actually think we're we're essentially halfway through. So we could take a break here. So what I'm going to do next time is uh, talk about the instinct to survive, about people's ambivalence, about uh, a couple of coping resources, play a very powerful video about a guy who jumped off the Golden Bay Bridge lift and now goes around the country helping people stay alive. And, um, and then all the stuff about what to do if someone calls in. So, that's what I have for the second part. But yes, we can, we can take a break right now and I can cover the end of part two and all part three next time. Are we, are we going to have people then ask questions? I, I would like to, yeah. Have Has anybody been listening? <laughs> yeah. Do people have any questions for Douglas before we uh, bring this to a close? I, I really appreciate everybody hanging together for such a long meeting. Going once. Any thoughts or any <laughs> feedback? Everybody feeling okay? It's kind of a heavy topic. By the way, um, uh, people on the line, she said it's a heavy topic. It's a heavy topic, but the good news is, I mean, everything that I write about in my books. Everything I. Well, I have a question for you. Um, my niece committed suicide when she was 23, and nobody knew she was suicidal. Yes, that, that unfortunately happened with my best friend's brother, who was 21. Uh, for some reason, some people, for whatever reason, they keep it inside, uh, and they don't talk about it or don't reach out for help, and, and that is why those tragedies happen. I don't know why. Some people don't reach out. Is it the stigma? I, you know, it probably depends on each person, but I'm really sorry about that because uh, it sounds like there's nothing you could have done. Were you just wanting to share that? No, I was just wondering, you know, what your thoughts were on it, why people do that and they don't even look say anything. At, look at Anthony you Bourdain. Know. Did you hear about that? I mean, he's world famous. He didn't mention that. I mean, sometimes people just 
decide not to tell? I don't know. I, I really, it's a mystery. They feel trapped, but yes, but then I felt trapped four different times when I asked for help. I mean, so the question is, why, yeah. why do some people ask for help and some people don't? I've been asking that question for 50 years, ever since I got into mental health, and it's a mystery. But some people or, are able to do that. They're able to reach out, and other people are not. And I don't know what separates the two, the two types of situations. But um, that's uh, I don't really have an answer except I'm, I'm sorry that she wasn't able to do that. Because if she had, yeah. reached out, she'd probably still be alive. Correct. Right. Well, that's why I say there's a 10 minute window between the time you, you, you say yes and the time you'll do it. Mm -hmm. But you still could call 1-800-SUICIDE, as I did, or you could go still call somebody. I mean, you could say, oh, oh I'm going to do this. I better not. And you could catch yourself. But sometimes people just are not able to do that. Given second, what what is your will and what what drives you at that given second? I feel like this what causes so many people to make that split second decision to just do it without any without any thought because their will is telling them that that's what they want to do and they're driven so they go through. Right. Well, they overcome the survival instinct, which I was I'll mm -hmm. talk about next week. Why the survival instinct is so powerful, but but there are there is ambivalence as you'll see next time I come here. But sometimes the impulsivity, and especially when people are drinking or on drugs, oh my God, then all, all sense of uh, restraint goes away. Was your niece uh, drinking at all, do you know? No, she wasn't on drugs or drinking, but she took the time to kill herself by a rifle, which isn't easy to do. And she, she what, didn't talk to people? Did, were, were there any warning signs? Was she no. Withdrawn? Just out of the blue. Yeah. That sounds totally Very fast. Sounds sounds totally shocking. Yeah, it was. God bless her. I hope her, her soul is, you know, having a better time the next time around. But anyway, I'm sorry for your loss. But no, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody, even Thomas Joyner or Schneidman, who spent their whole lives studying suicide, I don't think anybody, even them, can answer that question about what was going on, except that obviously she, something, uh, there was some sort of pain she was in or some way she wanted to escape pain, and this, is, this was her best solution. Yeah. Well, I know I talked to a police officer about it. He goes, sad to say, some people just snap. Yeah, well, that's what uh, Jordan said. Well, yeah. Oops. Douglas, I'm wondering, while we're all here together, if we could agree on the next time to meet. I was thinking I don't really want to wait uh, a whole month to have him return and finish this, because really the juicy stuff is really in that third uh, part. And I'm wondering if you guys are okay with doing this again in two weeks. So say that would be on July 30th. Do we want to just do the same? That sounds good. July 30th. Are people okay with that? Yeah, oh, we'll do it next. You want to do it next week? I could, I, I could do it. Thinking, right, two weeks For, in between it that's kind of too much forget. separation. Yeah, it's true. Because this is a week. great foundation. Let's do it next week, Bradley. I'm fine with that. Okay. How many people else? want? I can't do it next week. Yeah, this, this one woman said she couldn't do it next week. So you know what? That? So Sharon, why don't you take a poll of people yeah. now and later on, like the next day or two, and then get back to me? Okay. We so can see do if that. you can. This is what I do when I change my group meetings. I I try to see what how day I can. How can many? Do. I try to accommodate the most amount of people. Right. When I'm out of town on a Monday and we have to meet on a Wednesday, so go around, talk Thank to everybody, you. and see whether it's the 23rd or the 30th where the most, not everybody's going to make it, but maybe find the time where the most amount of people can make it. Exactly. And we are recording this, uh, you know, it works out that they can't make it. Oh, it's being recorded? Oh, yeah. well, that's great. Anything I say will be held against me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, okay, so Sharon will contact you guys and you'll decide which, uh, which Monday it should be. Don't, don't hang up yet. I'm also looking for someone that can close tonight, 6 to 11. Or they can come on now until 11. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Does anybody like uh, Does anybody like um, Robin, I'm here until 11. This is Velma. You're what? 
I work till 11. Yeah, you work until 11. I'm looking for somebody called out six today. I'm wondering if there is a second person that'd be willing to work six to 11 or now till 11. Okay, well, if anybody, any takers? If anybody changes their mind, please text me. Or even if they could do part of that shift. All right, thanks. Okay, this presentation will be continued either next week or the week after, and we will be in communication. Um... Oh, I want to say one last thing. Sure. So Sharon said, can you all guys hear me? So Sharon said, uh, yes. how was it for you guys? They really, this is a heavy topic, but my message is one of hope and recovery. I'm telling you, I'm 69. I had my first break when I was 18, so 51 years, both as a... As a, as a consumer and also as someone who got into the work as a mental health professional and a peer, and I'm telling you that in almost any every case that I've worked with personally or professionally, people have come out of it. So this is really about hope. And if that niece had actually asked for help, uh, all sorts of things could have happened. So there, there's nothing. If you have stage four cancer, you're done. You know, I used to think I'd rather have cancer, but no, because. You can fight, 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 and you have stage four cancer done, but you can overcome suicidal uh, thoughts and feelings and, and, and um, episodes. There's nothing that says you have to die, period. So I know that from my experience. So it's heavy, but it, it, this, is a, this is the preventable and healable situation. So that's it. I just have to assure people of that. Thank you. And you shine that light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. So, I think I'm asking for questions. And I mean, people here can ask me questions. If you guys, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm just I mean, wondering if we can. Yeah. Well, all right. Stay cool. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll be in touch to let you know when to come back on. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Put this on your time sheets. Blame your hours. Were there any were, were there any phone people? Were they all um go to people? I'm not sure if it's stop it. I guess uh, I have to stop uh, the whole and, meeting. And were they seeing the same slides that you're seeing? Yeah. Yep. Oh, that made it easy. Yeah. All right. Well I'm going to uh Get out of people's way and stand up. Well, shoot. I don't want to stop this. It doesn't seem to want to. Okay. Can you just, can you just sort of put it to sleep? Thing. or just, well, why you just see what close, happens. close the computer and put it to sleep? It's still going. Okay, so I'm going to have to be very efficient with what it says. This here. I'll probably do the shift tonight. You will? I love you. Oh, and meetings for all. I usually work.